In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. He said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And praise the Lord again, everyone. The Lord. Amen. I really was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. I understand that we can individually worship the Lord, and uh, that's the way it has to be. But I also realize that there's something about a collective worshiping of God that is so very special also. And when that takes place and the atmosphere begins to become what God wants it to be, then many, many things begin to transpire. It just can't happen any other way. There must be that type of deluge of spirit in our midst for God to move in those channels that He desires to move in. And I want to be a channel for that tonight. How about you? Praise the Lord. And making yourself available is what is important. And uh, again, we are so honored to be here. I appreciate, again, the invitation. It is a special honor. If you would, let's stand and we'll go to the Word of the Lord in the book of Genesis here tonight. Chapter 46. 46th chapter of Genesis, and bless all you good saints that have come out uh, again to the house of God here tonight, and uh, I believe that God really does keep in store those things that He has on His shelf for His best customers. Praise the Lord, and I want to be a best customer in the house of God. Praise the Lord. In Genesis chapter 46 and verse 31, And Joseph said unto his brethren and unto his father's house, I will go up and show Pharaoh and say unto him, My brethren and my father's house, which were in the land of Cana, are come unto me. And the men are shepherds, for their trade hath been to feed cattle. And they have brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have. And it shall come to pass. When Pharaoh shall call you and shall say, What is your occupation? That ye shall say, The servant's trade hath been about cattle from our youth even unto now. Both we and also our fathers, that ye may dwell in the land of Goshen. For every shepherd is an abomination unto the Egyptians. Praise the Lord. I don't know if you caught the, uh, the significance of what Joseph is instructing his brethren about in this episode, but hopefully, if not, we can bring it more clearly to your attention here in a few moments. But let me begin here tonight before we pray to say this, that we don't have to be a part of some things for it to affect us. I have lived in the vicinities of some chemical plants and things of that nature when I not own their property. Matter of fact, it can be quite a ways away, but the aroma... Sometimes of that that terrible smell can get in my front yard and can make me have certain uh, reactions to it because that it is infiltrating into my space. And uh, I know sometimes that uh, we cannot, just no way it's going to work. 
where that there are heaven high walls about all of us. Where that the influences of the things that you're around are not going to be able to get to you. It just doesn't work that way. But you don't have to be a part of some things for it to affect you sometimes. And so with that premise in mind tonight, I want to try to bring to you what I have felt on my heart here for this service tonight, and that is the Egyptian syndrome. The Egyptian syndrome. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us here in this place tonight. God, we come to you looking unto you expectantly that you will touch our hearts and our lives, that you will move upon every individual and every soul that's in this house. We're in need of your direction, of your help. And without you, we can truly do nothing. But with you, all things are possible. Most of all, give us understanding in your will and in your way and appreciation of the things of God as we've never had before. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Everybody say amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Someone has said, and I believe that there is a lot of a fact to this statement. I believe that it holds true very much, and that is that you can tell a lot about a man or a person by who their heroes are. That who it is that they esteem and who it is that they look up to and who it is that they pay attention to, that it has a lot to say not about their hero but about themselves. That when you begin to see their esteem and their affection for certain individuals, and in this world that we're living, there are two predominant things that the world as a whole is greatly affected by. And there's no use anybody trying to deny it because it's still a fact anyway. And I'm talking about the world as uh, the status quo goes out there, and that is that Hollywood and sports are two major, major influences upon the minds and the lives of men, women, and children that are indoctrinated into that type of mentality and that type of society. Like I said, there's no use anybody trying to deny it. The clothing styles, the, the, the words that are said, the actions that are taken, the, the things that they go to and the things that draw the money in heaps to certain piles is because of certain things that they are attracted to. Praise the Lord. And so the affection and the esteem that one gives to another has a whole lot to do with perspective. It has a whole lot to do with how they are looking at things and what it means to them in general. For instance, not everybody, not everybody appreciates the slogan on the police car that says to protect and to serve. Not everybody appreciates that slogan or what that's supposed to stand for. There are some individuals in this world that dread the sight of a police car. There are those that, that call those that are a part of that faction and part of that police society. They call them all kinds of hateful names. That's where the, the genderings of the words like pig comes from. That doesn't come from law-abiding citizens. That's not where that that word got coined. It got coined from the mouth of individuals that detest the policemen, not because of what the policeman is, but because of what they are. In other words, that if you are a thief, the last thing you want to see is a policeman. If you are a murderer, the last thing you want to see is a court of law. 
There is that which we are that makes us look on certain things as we do. And not everybody, as I said, appreciates that type of of slogan, nor what it's supposed to stand for. This very perspective that I'm talking about has everything to do with what it indicates about you more than the individual that you are honoring or esteeming. Praise the Lord. For instance, let me tell you this. The plumber, my whatever might uh, you may say about plumbers in general, I'm talking about his talent now. I'm talking about not the man per se, but the talent of the plumber, uh, that it can be a rightfully said maybe sometimes that he hasn't ever looked any better than he does through a spray of water from a broken water pipe. Know what I mean? And you don't know how to handle it. It's good to be able to see on the other side of that somebody that knows what to do. It's good to see on the other side of that spray that is going to quickly flood your house. Somebody that knows how to staunch it. Somebody that knows how to get it fixed. Somebody that knows how to change the situation. And the other time, you might not have a lot of esteem, but the situation that you're in, the perspective that you're viewing it from, has a whole lot to do with your ability to appreciate the value of an individual. Amen. That appreciation is something that uh, we don't really have a, a lot of appreciation for something that we don't understand the value of the talent involved. Praise the Lord. If you are not a skilled uh, uh, welder, then uh, maybe you wouldn't appreciate one that can do it really good. Praise the Lord. But when somebody that is uh, well-mannered in it themselves sees somebody that can perform it at the top, of their trade. Amen. There's always a tip of the hat regardless of who the man is and regardless of what color his face. Amen. You just got to say, that's a good job. There's people that looked at carvings of furniture that have been done not by some mechanical uh, uh, cutting device, but by the hand of a man that has carved and has uh, done such a marvelous job. I have seen uh, certain things that are hand carved and just had to shake my head and say, man, 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 somebody has some talent that did that. And uh, you you may not appreciate that as about uh, all you can figure is how to whittle a stick. But if you have a little something on the inside that understands what it takes to bring about that kind of perfection, then you begin to give a little bit of hand clap to the talent of somebody that can do that well. Well, praise the Lord. I want to show you something about the syndrome of the Egyptians, and that is that it wasn't just one or two, three or four or half a dozen. Or a quarter of the Egyptians. Or 50% of them. Or 75% of them. But there are two clarifying words in this mentality that is used. And it says that every, and that means all. Just like it means every one of you in Jesus' name baptism. It means everybody. Every, every shepherd is an abomination to an Egyptian, not just some Egyptians, not just to a few of them, but to the Egyptian culture itself, to the very mentality. And the consensus of Egyptians was that a shepherd is a low, despicable creature. That's what it says in your book right here, that every shepherd was an abomination to Every Egyptian. It was just something that was uh, in them, bred in them. You know, racism is something that most people uh, don't get older to learn. It's something that is put in them when they're brought up. It's something that a mom and dad has put into them. Not because they've given certain classes about who to hate and who to love. But it's just simply because of their words and actions through life teaches them certain lessons. 
Well, praise the Lord. So racism is something that people are not born with. It is, to a degree, a learned thing, but it is much more an environmental type situation. Just like it is about you learning a language. Language is an environmental type uh, uh, offcast. In other words, that you can take a, a Chinese-born child that... Uh, has just come from its mother's womb and extract it from the culture of the Chinese and take it from out of the country and take it to Kentucky. And guess what? When it grows up, it'll talk like a Kentuckian. As it will. Because the environment, what they hear spoken and what they are around is what will become part of their life. That is why it's so necessary and essential for us to have the right environments in life. That is why when we come to the house of God, there is a a culture that needs to be presented and an environment that we need to get into because it has a whole lot to do with how you feel, how you think, and how you motivate your life. Praise the Lord. Amen. But it was apparent that Oh, the overall feeling in Egypt was that shepherds were disgusting. Talking about those, those men whose trade was to tend sheep. Abomination. When you see the word abomination in the Bible, like you see it in Deuteronomy, about for a woman to wear that which pertaineth unto a man, it is not an abomination but abomination unto God. The word abomination means a hated thing. Very distasteful to God is what that expression means. An abomination. Every shepherd was an abomination to an Egyptian. They were a hated thing. It was just not a, a feeling of just a little bit of uneasiness about it. It was a, a, a great hatred that was bound up in the heart for a shepherd. Why all this is there? Well... The essence of what I'm trying to tell you is that it is there. That it states the fact that it is the way that Egyptians thought about shepherds. All of them, all shepherds were abominations to all Egyptians. Praise the Lord. Now, how strange is that? It wasn't because they didn't partake of the things that shepherds brought into their lives. Because they had... uh, Clothing made from the wool of the sheep that they tended. They ate the mutton that they also tended for the flocks. They were uh, part of their life. And it wasn't because it sheep were hated by Egyptians, but it was hated the man that took care of the sheep was the hated man. Like I said, that's in your Bible. And every, every shepherd, every shepherd is an abomination to an Egyptian. Can you imagine, you know, in our culture, for there are certain words that, that can start a fight in a hurry in the world out there where they can call certain names and certain things to certain individuals and, hey, you got a fight going here in a minute because when the name calling starts, then the shoving's soon to come. And then the fisticuffs to follow up in a hurry after that. And then the the bloody noses and the bruised uh, body and all the rest that goes along with it. But it starts out usually with name calling. Not many fights are started with calling somebody friend or nice guy. It's called by trying to find something that you conjure up that is derogatory to the other individual. Something that then there are, the world has certain phrases that are so despicable to call one another. Amen. That it is used to be so derogatory toward the individual. All types of manners of, of the, the essence of, of his existence and everything else that goes into it. But I can tell you this, a lot of fights were started in Egypt land among young boys that kind of got into a little tough. And when finally one of them called the other, you dirty Egyptian or shepherd, 
Brethren, calling one a shepherd, I mean, that's, that's it, but that's time to get with a pounding now. You done went too far to call me a shepherd because everybody knows shepherds are hated in the Egyptian society. And to call somebody else a shepherd, amen, that's fighting words. Amen. That's something that when you start calling somebody else, how many bar rooms fight broke out when uh, two drunks shoved one another and one of them finally calls the other one a shepherd? I'm telling you, it was all over then. It was just a roustabout after that. Amen. There is something about that type of mentality. And what I'm saying is that if you can see, I know that this looks like it will way back there, way back in the land of Egypt a long, long time ago. But the essence of Egypt is a type of the mentality of the world that you're living in. It is a persona of the personality and the mentality in general that you see in the world. Every time that the Bible uses Egypt as a type, it's always a type of carnality. It's always a type of the world. And I want you to understand something very well tonight. And that is that there is an overriding mentality in the world whether they want to admit it or not that every real true shepherd, I'm not talking about sheep keepers, uh, not in the natural, I'm talking about a man of God. I'm talking about God shepherd. I'm talking about the man that takes care of God's flock uh, is despised in their eyes. Uh, you don't believe it, just uh, take a little survey sometime. And you're going to hear about the Jim Joneses and the Jimmy Swaggerts and the, all the other whoever they were. And we all know they didn't have the truth. But they want to play in that label on everybody. It's called preacher. All the priests that have abused young boys and children. Amen. That somehow that nomenclature wants to be stuck on everybody is called a preacher because the devil loves to have it that way. If there's anything he fans to bring into a ferocious fire, it is that mentality because of this one reason. And that is that if you have a despising of the man of God, for instance, if you're a sinner that finally does come to church, and you have a despising of the man that's in the pulpit. You don't know him from Adam, but just because he's a preacher, he can't be trusted. He's not worthy of anything. He just wants your money. You've heard all that stuff. Amen. You know what the chances of them being touched by the gospel are? Next to nothing. Amen. But the devil wants everybody in the world to come up with the mentality of the Egyptian sin. Syndrome that every shepherd should be despised. And so it is that you come into this story. A long time before these people get to Egypt land, God already had a man there by the name of Joseph. He said, you meant it for me for evil, but God meant it for good. All things work to the good of them that love God and are called according to His purpose. Even though Joseph, back when it was happening, sure couldn't figure it out. What was going on when they tied that rope around his neck and saw his own brother sell him to a party that was going to Egyptian or Egypt. Amen. Knowing that he would be sold as a slave in Egypt land. He couldn't figure all that out, but God was working in the background with everything that was going on. And through the sequence of years, then of course we know that Joseph goes from Potiphar's house to prison, and from prison to the Pharaoh's palace itself. Second in authority because of what he has uh, from God and what God has used him for in the kingdom and instructing Pharaoh as to how to act on the famine and all those things. And, of course, the story goes on. But it is that Joseph is now such an authority and such a power in Egypt land, but he's not an Egyptian. He's like Moses of old. 
His mother kept whispering in his ear, amen, that, you know, you're going to end up in, in the hands of uh, the Egyptians. But I want you to know this, uh, you're not an Egyptian. You're not an Egyptian. You're not an Egyptian. You may be in a, in a Pharaoh's house and in that very special place, but let me tell you, you're not an Egyptian. That's what some folks need to tell yourself when you go to work. That's what some of you folks need to tell yourself when you go wherever it is on vacation, whatever you do. I'm not an Egyptian. I'm a child of God. I am different than this mentality of the Egyptian syndrome. Praise the Lord. But Joseph C. knows the ropes. He knows how Egyptians think. He knows the culture of the Egyptians. And so when his brethren come, In the will of God again, Joseph takes them aside. This is after he has discovered himself to them, and all those sequences have passed now. And he's saying to them, now you're coming into Egypt land. I just want you to realize that Pharaoh is on a kingdom and empire building project. He is building like never before. And he wants men that can be masons, men that are carpenters, men that are uh, good with the needle to make woven things and tapestry and all those other things, men that are good with shovels and men that are good with all the other things that it takes in the building of an empire. The sheep herders don't do nothing about building So I'm going to tell you now, he's going to call you for an audience, and he's going to bring you before him to find out what to do with you. And if you are not a doctor, and you're not a mason, and you're not a lawyer, and you're not a ditch digger, and you're not a carpenter, and you're not a a polisher of stone, and you're not any of those things, What I want to tell you is that when he does call you, he's going to ask you, what is your occupation? That's what he's going to be interested in. What kind of job do you do? Well, you get your resume ready. And you just have on it just a few short words. And you tell him, with flat-footed, look him straight in the eye and tell him, we're shepherds. Matter of fact, We're shepherds, and our daddy before us was shepherds. We ain't never known nothing but shepherding. As far as we can look back, we've always been nothing but shepherds. That's what you tell him. Because when you tell him that, get ready, his face is going to flush. His eyes are going to get steely, and he's going to grit his teeth. Because he don't have no place in his empire building for shepherds because every shepherd is an abomination to an Egyptian, including the Pharaoh. And when he hears that you are nothing but shepherds, guess what? He's not going to put you in the quarters where the carpenters are. He's not going to put you in the quarters where the masons are. He's not going to put you in the empire building project uh, uh, consortium and to the barracks that are there for that. But you know what he's going to do? He's going to put you way out from the kingdom. He's going to send you to another place. And God has used this mentality to put His people into a separated place, even into an environment that is away from the empire builders and away from the things that the world's after and put them into Goshen land. Because that's where He's going to send you. And guess what? That's where God wants you. Oh, thank God, we may be in this world, but we're not of it. I said, we may be in it. You may live on the street, but sinners on the left and sinners on the right. But we're not of this world. He said, I'm going to use that, that hatred of shepherds that don't have any respect for shepherds to make you a separate people and a separate people that are predominantly respecters. Of shepherds. That's what I'm going to do with you. And that's how it's going to come to pass. 
Amen. Let me tell you. You see the, the difference and the contrast between an Egyptian and a child of God? What is that psalm that is so, even most people in the world know this psalm. Even at least the beginning words of it. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd. Everybody know that one? Psalms 23. Amen. But in the world and in the Egyptian mentality, every shepherd was hated by an Egyptian. What kind of Egyptian would say, Amen, the Lord is my shepherd. Right. But you see, the people that love the Lord, even there is no other place and no other high honor than that which is of the shepherd. We serve the sheep shepherd, even which is Jesus Christ, the shepherd of our souls. We are the sheep of His flock and of His pasture. Even He leadeth us beside the still waters. And then He has under shepherds. Amen. As under shepherd, that's why the Lord on the day when Peter has said to him about the answer to the question when Jesus repeatedly asked him, do you love me? And Peter said, yes, Lord. And so the Lord asked again, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. But he didn't stop there, did he? He again, after that Peter has pronounced a love for his master, Jesus looks at him and says, I'm going to put you in an occupation that the world despises. And the Egyptian mentality is against everything that it stands for because I want you to feed my Sheep, if you really love me, feed my flock. If you really love me, feed them. If you really love me, even put out the granary, put out the wheat, put out the things that are for my flock. And I'm telling you again, there are a lot of aspirations about preachers trying to prove their love for God and their love for the flock that they pastor. But I'm telling you, you never see a greater display of the love for a man for his God than when he's feeding the flock of God. When that he is taking the Bible and putting it down even and raising it into to your heart uh, and saying, this is the way, walk you in it. Uh, even feeding you on righteousness, uh, feeding you on the will of God, feeding you in the ways of God. I'll tell you, you're seeing a display of not a preacher that's upset with everybody, but a preacher that's in love with his God that's trying to feed the sheep. That's what's going on. There is no greater hallmark of the love of a preacher for his God than to feed his sheep. Be a shepherd, Jesus was saying. Be a shepherd. It'll be the thing I know that's lowly esteemed in the eyes of the Egyptians in this world, but to the people of God, it is a different thing. The Egyptian syndrome is just that. It has a despising of shepherds. You know, in the world we're living today, in so-called religious realm that we're in, everybody wants to talk in tongues. That was one time when only the folks across the tracks did that. That was a time when that was looked down on. But now then, it's in form, brother. It's in style. Amen. Everybody wants to prophesy. Everybody wants to get out and, and, and clap their heels together and do all the other things. But I'll tell you what, the line's drawn at when somebody would try to preach to them. That's not what they're interested in. They want to go to church and have a howl time while anybody telling them, this is the way of the Lord, walk in it. But again, I'm telling you, you don't have somebody that that just came in off the street. You've got a shepherd. You've got a man of God, called of God, son of God, to feed this flock. And if you're an Egyptian, it will soon show itself because you will despise a shepherd. Oh, God, don't ever let that kind of spirit get a hold of your heart. So when the interviews take place, and they will. Here comes the line. 
There's all these people coming from all over the world to see because there's grain in Egypt. People are coming. I saw a picture some time back of in the job crunch that we're in of one place that had only a few hundred uh, places that would be filled, that there was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of applicants standing at the door waiting to get in, knowing that there was only going to be a few that even got a chance at it. And down that long line, here they came before Pharaoh. And they want to tell him the things that have put them in the in the right place. I mean, right in the middle of the best part of it all. If you got any skill at all to be a carpenter, tell him you're a master carpenter. If you got any skill at all in masonry, you tell him, man, I know how to work with stone. You got a sure place in the kingdom. If you are somebody that has medical skills and they need uh, uh, men that can have medical uh, proficiencies and talents to help keep everybody else working and going, you'll find a place. If you can be a, even a soldier that has something to kind of help keep order and police in the streets, then you'll have a place. And so down the line they came, and they were saying when he got up to the recorders over here and Pharaoh standing there and recorders writing the name down and waiting for one question, that is, what is your occupation? What do you do? The man says, I'm a carpenter. Pharaoh smiles, said, I have need of men like you. You go that way. I'm a mason. Glad to have you on board. I can dig ditches. We need ditch diggers. Get over there. But here comes these Israelites walking up to Pharaoh. And Joseph's already told them, don't you even mess around. You tell him flat-footed what you are. So they step before Pharaoh and says, what is it you fellas do? So we're shepherds. Matter of fact, my daddy was a shepherd and his daddy was a shepherd. And matter of fact, it just goes way on back that we were shepherds as far as I know. Before there was probably even sheep, we were shepherds. <laughs> you get ready. Because when you tell him that, he ain't going to be pleased with you. He's going to clench his jaw. He's going to grab the recorder by the shoulder and say, don't you write them down in that part over there. Flip over there to reject. We've got, don't you go that way. Y'all go that way. Sounds like a gist, doesn't it, y'all? Y'all go that way. That will be under Goshen. You're going to Goshen. And every one of them that answered, I'm a shepherd. Goshen for you. Goshen for you. Goshen for you. Until all those Israelites and all those leaders of those uh, people ended up taking their people to Goshen because that's where God wanted them. Even because of this despising of a shepherd, that was where they were going to end up. Let me tell you that God still loves shepherds. Why? Because He's got sheep. And there's one time in the Bible when He looked down and said, Oh my, amen, it is so terrible to see this this terrible thing that's going on. There are sheep without a shepherd. There is nothing any more distressing than to see sheep without a shepherd. That is why that the voice of the 23rd Psalm is in the voice of a sheep. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not walk. Thank God there's somebody watching over me. Thank God there's somebody to take care of me. Thank God there's somebody to lead me. Thank God there's somebody to bring peace into my life. Y'all hearing what I'm telling you? I'm telling you to thank God for the chief shepherd, Jesus Christ. And also thank God for the under-shepherd, which is your pastor. Don't have no need of no shepherds around here. It's not part of our kingdom, not part of our empire. How can I emphasize this strongly enough? 
that they have the proper love and respect for the talent of a preacher is something that you ought to cherish. Because in this world, you hear me, there are people that have stomped on it, eroded it, spit on it, and drug it through the ditch. So they have nothing good to say about a man of God. That's as good as the devil wants to. Because believe it or not, how shall they hear? You want to answer the question? This is not something to be debated. This is a, a statement that is an answer in itself. How shall they hear without a preacher? And God chose by the foolishness of preaching. That's not talking about foolish preaching. It's talking about what the world considers foolishness. It's what the world considers to be despised. By that process, God chose to save them that believe. We got any believers in here tonight? We got any folks that when a preacher gets to the podium and opens up this blessed black back book that somebody stand up and say, come on preacher, preach to us. Save my family. Save my babies. Keep us in where we need to be. Let us know what the Lord doth require. Somebody said, what I need a preacher for? Because if you're not a preacher, you need a preacher. Matter of fact, preachers need preachers. That's why it's a fivefold ministry. That, that respect. That, that Let me clear something. I think everybody that's in this church knows this fact well enough. This man never desires you to worship him. That's only for God to worship. To Him alone. Preachers are not wanting to be worshipped. Matter of fact, it's not a matter of what they want. It's a matter of what the Word says for us to do. To honor them. Amen. To esteem them very highly for their work's sake or for their talent. But this is a talent that a man didn't learn even in a carpenter shop or in a masonry uh, school. This is a talent that he learned on his knees. This is a talent that he learned by being drunk to the knot hole backwards more times than you can count. This is a, the things that he learns by having sickness and seeing God help. This is the times where he went through heartbreak and heartache and fight more tears off his face and some people have drank water in their life. Let me tell you, that's what makes a man of God is a call of God. And I'm telling you, thank God for men that are still honored and respected as God's shepherds. Real apostolic churches have an honor and respect for the ministry. Praise the Lord. And that is true without any deviation whatsoever. Praise the Lord. You know, there are those that David was called. There were bigger guys in the house, more powerful guys in the house, more learned men in the house. But when Samuel came, he went to each of Jesse's boys and said, No, this is not him. The Spirit of God in him said, No, this is not him. No, this is not him. He went through every boy in the house until there was none left. And God has said, no, this is not him to every one of them. So Samuel knew something was up. And he looked at Jesse and said, have you got another son? He said, I do, but he's just a lad besides that. He don't know nothing about war. He don't know nothing about rulership. He don't know nothing about it. All that kind of business. He's just a shepherd of the boys. All he is. Samuel said, y'all keep standing. And somebody send for that boy. Because we're not sitting down till the king comes. You're talking about David, the little shepherd boy? You better believe he was. That it wasn't God's recognition on the powerful and the strong and the rich and the and the fluent and all the other things that men give such 
uh, classifications to and all the rest, and about how, that, how charisma that they are intoned with. There is one thing that makes a man of God a man of God, and that is the call of God that is on him. And I think everybody in this church understands well. Amen. You've got somebody that was called. You've got somebody with the anointing on their life. You've got somebody that labors in word and in doctrine. And this church, again, ought to be so thankful for well, there is a world that says, I don't need no preacher. I don't, I ain't gonna listen to no man tell me what to do. I ain't paying my tithes. Egyptians never pay their tithes. But thank God for good people of God that say, hey, I'm a sheep. I need a shepherd. If there's any hearts in this place tonight that's swelling up with a, with a disgust of what I'm saying, you have been affected. By the Egyptian syndrome. Oh God, I wouldn't be in your shoes for a million dollars. I loved preachers before I was a preacher. I don't believe God calls men that doesn't. This world today doesn't respect a watchman on the wall. They don't want anybody telling them that what they're doing is wrong. They sure don't want to find out that they need to do something different in their life. Aren't you glad God's still working on you? And the way He keeps doing that is through the Word of God. This hammer, this chisel, this perfecting tool for the perfecting of the saints. That doesn't mean perfect saints. It means for the continual maturing of the saints to keep them going on, notching up, notching up, and going on with God as we continue. I was in L.A. airport some years ago, and a big commotion going over on one side of the big terminal there, and people were just crowded all around and all kind of uh, carrying on and People excited, you tell something's going over there. And finally, I asked them. I said, "What? What's happening over there?" And they said, uh, and "I forgot who his name was, but uh, some basketball player, highly renowned and known, happened to be in the terminal over there, changing planes, whatever it was. And bro, they were pushing and shoving and trying to get their pencils out and a piece of paper or something." Right on the shirt for his autograph. For some of them, it's the first time in their life they've even been in living close contact with somebody like that. But you know what that guy that they are giving all type of esteem to, to his talent? He ain't never prayed for one of their babies. He didn't ever come to nobody's hospital and Came in by your bedside and prayed with you. Never when you were heartbroken that took you in and said, look, God's going to do things in life. Somebody prayed on the carpet for you when your house was seemingly in tatters and things were coming apart. There was a preacher that cared enough to reach for you. And I see folks come to church. Until we let the familiar bring contempt in our life. I mean, they were pushing and shoving. I just, I just want you all to grab. He ain't never done nothing for none of them of any significance whatsoever. He doesn't even know their name. It's just important. You know mine is what the story was with him. I see folks that many times that have heard some of the most anointed, God-reaching messages in their life, never even venture to the front to say, thank you, Pastor, for preaching to me. I don't mean that every night there has to be a line for them. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about somewhere along the road, though. Sure, there's been times and places where the a message has been the saving factor of your life and added to your life. Surely there's a place and time where the 
You can find just a moment. It doesn't have to take an hour or a week or, or any time consumption of that matter. It's just a matter of just paying a little recognition to say, thank you. Amen. Sometimes the thank you can go a long, long, long way. Right. Of course, there's a whole world of Egyptians out there that are spitting, right. cursing, and hating. Right. Thank God for God's shepherd and folk that have an honor and respect for it and for him and for the office of itself. That is why that when the elder brings somebody else in, if he opens up his pulpit to them, it means that he has had confidence in them or he wouldn't have them up there. You don't have to know the man from, from Adam or from anybody else. But because your pastor had confidence, you ought to say, thank God for the preacher. I'm, talking, I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about in the, in the sequence of events from this night forward. Thank God for a pastor. Like I said, I've been around your pastor for years. Even though that he's... I know he turns down a whole lot more invitations than he accepts. I know that. But even though that when he is away preaching in a conference and whatever else, you can be sure of this, that your faces, your needs, are still right there branded on his heart. While he's preaching to others that he doesn't know their stories and their faces and their situations that are under some other shepherd, he never relinquishes the, the, the position of a shepherd that God called and placed him right here in this church. I can assure you that is the truth. Thank God for people that honor and respect the man of God. Because like I said at the outset of this tonight, you don't have to be a part of something to begin to be affected by it. I've known people that even my ministry over the years that kin folks and neighbors began to, you know, just beat the guns and beat the guns and beat the guns and beat the guns and beat the guns, guns till it wore down and wore down and wore down and wore down. Why this and why that and why do you have to do this and why do you have to do that and all the rest of that stuff and I know preachers did this and preachers did that. You can let me tell you something about this little business about getting down on all preachers because you can find some that went bad. You just better thank God that the same tit for tat is not given. Because for every preacher that failed, I can bring you up a thousand saints that bit the dust. So do you think that pastor gets in the pulpit and said, Oh, they're all like they're all on the edge of walking out and quitting and doing wrong and failing? Huh? All of them are not honest and all the rest of that. That's what some people do with preachers. But that this man comes back to the pulpit in regards to the failures he's seen in life. And right on from the very pews that are in this house, he comes back to the podium and says, let's go on with God. Amen. Thank God for good saints. And thank God for a man that has brought recognition. Amen. Saying, let's honor our elderly folk that have been right here and kept the doors open. I heard him say that tonight. Amen. People that come on praying and waited until that somebody else got here. Thank God for a man that has a heart for his church. So I'm just telling you tonight, the Egyptian syndrome is real. And I've seen a lot of folks on Pentecost pews get affected by it until they start that tithing envelope and say, he wears a better suit than I got. You see, you got the wrong conception about all that. You're not paying tithes to Him. But the Bible says it is holy. That means separated unto the Lord. And when you pay it to the Lord, the Lord gives His workers worthy of their heart. You don't buy this man. You don't pay this man. 
God's the one that does that. You say, well, it's my money. I'm going to tell you, you've already got a problem. But oh, aren't you so thankful to be able to take the tenth of that increase in your life of all the things God has done for you and given you, not just in the very fact, amen, that you've got money in your pocket, but what kind of a monetary value can you put on the rosy cheeks of a baby? What kind of monetary value can you put on the peace that you feel when you go to bed at night? You tell me, amen, what kind of value is that in your life? That God that gave you breath and God that gave you the shoes on your feet. And God that gave you the bread on your table. Amen. That God that is keeping you. What kind of business is it to have a revulsion about paying tithes? God said you robbed me. Not the preacher. Oh, I would never want to be a robber of God. But you know what? That, that's no problem with folks that have the honor and respect that they have. It is a privilege. Real privilege to take that tithe and envelope. Say, God, you've been so good to me. You've given me everything in life. I remember where you found me. And I would have already been in hell already tonight if it hadn't been for your mercy and your grace. Thank you, Jesus. And thank you for this house. My brothers and my sisters, and thank you, Lord, for a pastor that you called. And a pastor that you imprinted my name somewhere on his heart. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I am not an Egyptian. Let's stand, would you please? Churches that have a real respect for the ministry don't find anything to kick about what I've said tonight. It's just a yes and amen. Hey, we know that. We understand that. You're right, preacher. This is what it ought to be and the way it ought to be. And that's the way we, we live here. Thank God for it. And I believe that's pretty well the case of everybody in this building tonight. I'm just saying this to you. That in my front yard, the chemical plant caused me to wrinkle up my nose and to have a sickness in my stomach feeling from what I was smelling a long ways away from where I was. And in this world that we're living in today, a lot of things can filter over into your territory. And the devil will see to it that he intensifies it if he sees that it's affecting you. Thank God for saints that say, nothing is sweeter to me in my life than the Holy Ghost and the preacher that helps me keep it. Praise the Lord. Lift your hands. And let's love the Lord together here tonight. Your hidden glory in creation Now revealed in you our Christ What a beautiful name it is What a beautiful name it is You sing The name of Jesus Christ my
were opened and another book was opened which is the book of life and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works and the sea gave up the dead which were in it and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them and they were judged every man according to their works and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire this is the second death and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire When they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. 